is a production of DallasCowboys.com and the Dallas Cowboys Football Club. How about this, Cowboys? Yeah! Go, baby. Are you ready for a break? Uh, yes. Are you ready for a break? Absolutely. Ready for a break? Yeah, and um, so much for that. It's time for The Break on DallasCowboys.com. We were on the break! With Nick Eatman, David Hellman, Ambar Garcia, and Derek Eagleton. It is Wednesday, September 16th, 2020, season 16, episode number 24. Welcome to another edition of The Break. We are live from the SWBC Mortgage Studios at the Star. We've got Dave Amber at the Star as well in different locations. We also have our special guest, Bucky Brooks, who is joining us again this week. He'll be on with us every week on Wednesdays and Thursdays. He'll give us some analysis on the upcoming opponent this week. Obviously, we're talking about the Atlanta Falcons. A little later in the show, though. Uh, we'll have a few things we got to get into. We got some transactions that the Cowboys made yesterday. A little report that just came out that we're going to talk a little bit about in the second segment as well. And then we'll have a little bit more conversation later in the show around the Cowboys defense and what we saw from them last week and how they prepare for next week. So, no further ado, let's welcome in Bucky Brooks from NFL Network. Bucky, welcome to the show. Hey man, thanks for having me on. All right, let's let's jump right in. I had a couple questions for you. I'm going to start with kind of a big big picture question for you. Uh, just as you look at the Atlanta offense, talk to me about what you think is their greatest strength, and then what you think is their greatest weakness. Uh, their best strength, the biggest strength, of their skill players. They are loaded uh, at the perimeter positions. Three wide receivers that can play. Calvin Ridley, Julio Jones, Russell Gage has emerged. Ty Gurley in the backfield when healthy is one of the best running backs that you'll see. And then you have a former MVP and Matt Ryan. So their offense is loaded with firepower. I would say their biggest weakness is up front. Um, they have struggled in the past being able to dominate people at the point of attack. Uh, in the trenches, they can be overwhelmed at times. And even though they fancy themselves as wanting to be a physical offense, they're a little more finesse in the way they're constructed at the line of scrimmage. Now, after week one of watching this first game of the Cowboys, obviously we noticed many, many struggles in the defense. What is something, an area that the Cowboys can actually improve within just one week when they get ready to face the Falcons? Uh, I think the big thing, uh, now that Mike Nolan has trotted out the guys and he understands what he has from a defensive standpoint, they have to dominate each and every week up front at the line of scrimmage. Demarcus Lawrence has to be a five-star player. He is expected to be their best pass rusher. They need him to play at that level because he is the guy that sets the table. Alden Smith gave tremendous effort a week ago. He is heavy-handed. He's solid against the run. Everson Griffin is still settling in. But the biggest area where the Cowboys have to improve, they have to dominate at the line of scrimmage because you don't expect the secondary to hold up each and every week with the young guys that they have. So they have to be able to disrupt the timing and rhythm of the passing game by really controlling everything at the point of attack. Who's the best receiver from Alabama in the NFL? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think this is easy. I think Julio Jones is the prototypical number one receiver that everyone wants. He's big, he's fast, he's physical, he's an outstanding route runner, he's a playmaker with the ball in his hands. I think the only thing that you can knock Julio Jones on is, for whatever reason, in Atlanta, they haven't found a way to get him enough touchdowns. He hasn't been the dominant player in the red zone. Based on his skill level, you would think that he would be a touchdown waiting to happen. It just hasn't worked out for him in Atlanta. But look, man, there's, the guy averages 117 yards per game. He is hard to deal with when he gets it going. Um, he's phenomenal. He's a phenomenal player. Who's second then? Bucky, I, oh. I was just going to ask follow up. Who's the second best from Alabama? Amari Cooper? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, like it's funny because Amari Cooper would have to be there because uh, he is more established and more consistent than I would say Calvin Ridley. Calvin Ridley kind of plays in the sidecar. But Amari Cooper, look, Amari Cooper is a fantastic player. I think the expectations are always very lofty for him because of where he is now. He's with the Dallas Cowboys. He's on the big stage. People expect uh, Cowboy number one receivers to be exceptional players. But I think when you look at him and look at his body of work, it's hard to dispute that he's not a phenomenal player, that he's not a top ten wide receiver. Bucky, I want to go back to what you brought up about the Cowboys' pass rush, which, yeah, I mean, that is going to be how the defense succeeds. I agree with you. But 
the Rams didn't really give him a chance if you watch that game on Sunday. I mean, Jared Goff was getting rid of the ball very quickly for the most part. When I think of Atlanta, I think of Matt Ryan take, taking deep shots downfield, which, you know, maybe that helps the Cowboys, but is that accurate? Or, or are we going to see this again where Atlanta doesn't even give the Cowboys pass rush a chance to get going? It's funny that you said that when you study the numbers from Matt Ryan's performance against the Seattle Seahawks, he really struggled on passes, air yards, fewer than 10 yards, meaning the quick rhythm pass game. For whatever reason, the first half against the Seahawks, he was right at about a 50% completion mark. Uh, didn't really have a lot of success. Now, when the Seahawks backed off at the end of the game in the fourth quarter and kind of played that two-minute defense, he was 11 for 11. But the numbers are deceiving. But yes, uh, the way the Rams attack the Cowboys the quick rhythm throws, the, the bubble screens, the quick outs, the movement passes where they neutralize the pass rush by really getting the ball out in under two and a half seconds. That is the way teams will approach the Dallas Cowboys. And so that puts the onus on the corners. Um, as much as we talk about them, as much as we want to see them get more interceptions, they're going to have to walk up and put their hands on wide receivers to disrupt the timing. And so Mike Nolan may have to get out of his comfort zone. He may have to play a little more man-to-man, -man, a little more pressure to try and disrupt the rhythm of the Atlanta Falcons passing game. Bucky, against the uh, Seahawks, uh, the, the Falcons put up 522 yards of total offense, second in the NFL last week uh, in week one. Why did they end up losing? Like, that's a lot of yards. Obviously, they only scored 24, 25 points. But why did they end up losing after having such a, what looks like such a productive offensive day? Because they were basically eating potato chips, a lot of empty calories, a lot of empty <laughs> calories in the fourth quarter. They were chasing, they were chasing points, and in, in the the fourth quarter, that's really when Matt Ryan got going. But early in the game, this was a very competitive game, and what happened? They went for it on fourth down. They were stopped. Mm -hmm. The Seattle Seahawks came back and kind of stretched it out. Mm -hmm. uh, but this game in the in the in third quarter, fourth quarter, it was 21-12. It was pretty tight. The Seahawks had a couple things go their way and stretched out. Then in the fourth quarter, it was previous defense, Matt Ryan kind of throwing it down the yard. They were still throwing the ball with less than a minute left, and so that's where the yards come. I think the big thing when it comes to the Falcons, how are they going to play? Dirk Cutter can't put the ball in Matt Ryan's hands and say throw it 54 times and think that that's a winning recipe. Todd Gurley has to be a bigger factor, and will they be committed to running the ball to kind of balance out this offense? The way the L.A. Rams were able to win, they ran the ball, they were very patient and it was a ball control uh, approach they played with their offense to keep Dallas's offense on the sideline and more teams are going to do that because when you really look at the Cowboys offense it is really an unstoppable unit they only can stop themselves so you have to play a little keep away to keep them on the sidelines the Atlanta Falcons will probably take some of that approach to try and take some of the air out of the game now, something that a lot of fans keep uh, bringing up is the Cowboys' run defense and how uh, inefficient they've been last year and even a little this year in this first game. When you speak about the Falcons, do you see this being a problem with the running game that they got going on over there? Well, I mean, here's the thing about the National Football League. Once you put stuff on tape that you can't defend, you're going to have to defend it each and every week until you show that you can stop it. So the Rams are going to take, I mean, the Falcons are going to take what the Rams did, and they're going to put some of those things into play. They're going to run the outside zone. They're going to continue to see if they can pound it, if the Dallas Cowboys are disciplined enough to stop it early. If they stop it early in the game, you won't see it again. But if the Cowboys don't stop the run early in the game, the first quarter rushing yards will really matter. If they don't stop it, they're going to get a heavy dose of the run game. You can't allow a team to have 40 rushing attempts too many rushing attempts. You really got to cut it off, and you have to get the game where you're dictating. Part of the reason the Cowboys, I don't think they played a bad defensive game, but they never could control the game because they couldn't get the Rams in long yardage third down situations, third and two, third and three, third and four. It's even, Steven, it's easy for the play caller to do it. So against the Rams, they have to win first and second down to force the, Ram, force the Falcons to throw in obvious passing downs. Uh, Bucky, I did not see the Falcons game. I'm curious, though. They didn't go for it on fourth down. Should they have kicked the field goal instead? And it, are they still talking about that in Atlanta all week? Well, so here's the thing with the Falcons. The Falcons were 0 for 4 on fourth down attempts. And so they had mm. a fake punt where they, they got the first down, but the guy fumbled it. 
gave it back to the Seahawks in red zone territory. They went for it on a fourth and six, didn't get it in the red zone. And then they had a couple other failures. And so, um, yeah, they're disappointed because they were trying to be aggressive. But the thing about being aggressive, when it doesn't go your way, you have to answer for it. And so uh, fourth down would be a huge game considering both teams tried to be aggressive and it didn't go their way. It'd be interesting to see how those situations play out on Sunday. Buck, yeah, you, you kind of touched on this when you were answering Amber's question. but And, and this, it feels like it goes back to last season with the Cowboys defense, too, in the sense that like if you watch the game, it felt like they got dominated. You know, they gave up 153 rushing yards, uh, and they obviously lost the game. They also only allowed 20 points, and they actually only allowed 3.8 yards per carry. You know, I feel like the, the, the narrative here, and I'm not saying it's wrong, but people are dogging on the run defense, dogging on Jalen Smith for the way that he played. Uh, between the linebackers and the defensive tackles, what did you see from them? How poorly or maybe not as poorly as we think did you think they played? I think outside of the first drive, I felt like the defense was pretty solid. The first drive, uh, a couple things happened. The tempo that the Rams were operating with, the misdirection game that they were using, meaning the fly sweep action with the zone and the counters and those things coming behind it, 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 it can put your defenders in quicksand because you just don't know where to go. And I would give Sean McVay credit. He had them operating at a fast clip. He threw a lot of stuff at them. But really, as well as the Rams looked like they were playing, at halftime, it was a 14-13 lead for the Cowboys. And when you go back and you really look at the game, if the Cowboys kick the field goal early in the fourth quarter, it's a 20-20 ball game. And what you do is you now put the pressure back on Jared Goff to have to make plays. And so I may understand the gamble, but I would say the way the game was, it was an unnecessary gamble because it was an even game and the Rams hadn't generated any big plays. And so at some point, you have to think, Jared Goff is going to give you another opportunity to get a turnover. And so they kind of let the Rams off the hook by going for it and not getting it. That stings. It stings to hear you say that. I can see the smirk on Derek's face. <laughs> you knew I was over here smiling about it. You knew I was over smiling. I had a few more questions for you, though, Bucky. It's kind of shocking to me that we've gone through all these questions and nobody still asks about Todd Gurley. He's a guy that, that obviously coming in the league was very, very highly touted, had some years of really great production, and then over the last couple of years experienced a lot of injuries. Does he look like he's back to 100% at this point, or, or is he still battling some things that, that just are going to be a part of his game for the rest of the time he plays in the NFL? Well, I mean, I think the one thing that we don't know, we never will have a true sense of how he feels. On tape, he looked like the same guy. That first drive, the first two drives that he had for the Falcons, he ripped off a couple of big runs, had a 15-yard run where he looked as spry as ever. The thing that Ty Gurley has run up against, he has play callers who prefer to pass the ball as opposed to run it for whatever reason. He is a very talented back, but they get enamored with throwing the ball all over the yard, and sometimes they forget about the running game. I do believe against the Cowboys, the running game will be a big part of their recipe because they don't want to give the ball to Dak Prescott, Ezekiel Elliott, in that offense. So I would think that you would see Ty Gurley touch it more. But I'll say this, when Ty Gurley gets it 20 times, his record, his team record, is 22 and one. When he gets it 25 times, he is undefeated. So to me, it's pretty simple. If this was a video game, I'm gonna make sure that he gets it 20 or more times and see what happens. We'll see if the Atlanta Falcons follow the script. Real quick before you let you go, one more question. Uh, not many teams have had success defending Julio Jones over his career, but in the instances where he has been somewhat neutralized or at least kept in check, what have those teams done? Man, you gotta commit to taking him away. You have to double team. He's too good to play one-on-one. -on -one. So you have to have a safety over top. You have to play uh, a little two-man where the corner is trailing and playing underneath him and undercutting all of the routes that he has with a safety over top. You have to make a concerted effort to take him away. The problem with the Falcons, they're so good in other areas that they can work you with Calvin Ridley, Russell Gage showed up, and those things. But I think if you are a gambling man, if you're Mike Nolan, you live with those other guys getting their yards. What you can't do is you can't let Julio Jones dominate this game. You have to figure out, who do I want to take away? We've seen Julio Jones go for 300 yards. He cannot be a factor. Make Calvin Ridley, make Russell Gage, make make Hunter Hayden, Hayden Hunter, whatever. You got to make those other, Hayden Hurst, make those other guys do stuff. You can't let Julio Jones be the guy to beat you. 
All right, man. We appreciate you taking some time with us today. Another week of really great stuff. We'll have you back tomorrow. I'll talk a little bit about this Atlanta Falcons defense. Uh, we're going to take our first break. When we come back, we're going to jump into some transactions. We're going to talk a little bit about a uh, report out there on Sean Lee and maybe what his status is over the next few weeks. We'll talk about that when we come right back. This is DallasCowboys.com Radio. We're back with a tasty treat that's sweeping airwaves and taste buds. It's new Dr. Pepper and Cream Soda. Let's take a listen. Dr. Pepper and Cream Soda's here. A new combo that's music to my ears, okay. Let's play. Cream Soda and Dr. Pepper time. Pour it in a glass of ice. Ah, music to my ears and mouth. New Dr. Pepper and Cream Soda. A delicious duet. Want to use what the pros use? How about the official men's skincare brand of the Dallas Cowboys? Jack Black. Right now, you can get the Jack Black Starter, a curated collection of Cowboys locker room favorites for just 10 bucks with free shipping. The starter includes four Jack Black skincare favorites plus a full-sized intense therapy lip balm. Go to getjackblack.com slash cowboys and use the code word TEAMJB. That's getjackblack.com slash cowboys. The Jack Black Starter, 10 bucks, free shipping. Since 1865, Stetson hats are American-made with pride right here in Texas. And Stetson is proud to be on the field with America's team. Want to show your Texas and team pride, too? You can. By purchasing your own Stetson, you can look just like how the flag guys do on field at every home game. Stetson hats, the official crown of all self-respecting Cowboys and your favorite football team. Get yours today at shop.dallascowboys.com or at stetson.com. It's funny. As we travel places, often we find the places we want to travel aren't really places at all. They're people. They're grandparents, moms, old friends, and new nephews. That's why at American Airlines, we've been using enhanced cleaning measures so you can feel confident every step until you get to them. So as always, our people can't wait to take you to yours. American Airlines, you are why we fly. To the break. Elevate your work environment at Formation at the Star, offering a unique workspace, amenities with a variety of membership options, including private offices, dedicated desks, and open workspace. Book a tour at Formation at the Star.com. Welcome back. It is the second segment of the break. We are live from the SWBC Mortgage Studios at the Star. Nick and Amber joining us as well from the Star in uh, other offices. We've got uh, we just finished up with Bucky Brooks. Really good segment. Uh, if you didn't get a chance to check it out, make sure you go back and check it out. He had uh, a lot of good nuggets about that Atlanta Falcons offense. Tomorrow again, we will have him on the show. He will probably be in the third segment tomorrow though, but he will be on the show talking about the Atlanta defense versus the Cowboys offense. Nick. Run me down some. Uh, I know there were some transactions that the Cowboys uh, did yesterday. Uh, they signed a couple players, and and I just want you to kind of run down the players and maybe what you think this means relative to uh, the players that they signed. Let me find uh, the list here because I've lost it. Um, just because there was a bunch. There's a bunch going on. I mean, yeah. they signed off the practice squad of the Cardinals. They signed a tackle, Alex Light. They signed a linebacker, Rashad Smith, off the Bears practice squad. I think those are the two biggest things. They did activate Brandon Carr again from the practice squad. Still learning what those rules mean. I thought he was already on the team. I guess he gets to get moved back to the practice squad. For those two that they are allowed to bring up on <laughs> I guess. Saturday, I guess. I guess the, the biggest part is, and then they, they signed some other guys to the practice squad. Uh, Place Cam Irving on uh, IR to return. Same with Jarwin and Van Der Esch. Um, I think the biggest part is that they they signed a tackle and a linebacker that they feel like are better than the guys they have. So um, Francis Bernard, I guess, is not really in the equation for them to play. Yeah. They just want him to develop. Uh, Rashad Smith, I guess, is a better option. Alex Light, a tackle. Uh, this also, uh, you know, guy that they feel like is more ready to play. But you've got they've got 72 hours. They got to pass, uh, you know, I think three tests or so just to just to get in the door. So they're not ready to play right now, but just ready to play at some point. You guys know how those rules work as far no. as obviously when you sign a <laughs> when you sign no, a guy no from the practice squad of another team, you have to sign them to your active roster. You can't take them and move them to your right. practice squad. Once they are though established right. on your roster, can you then move them back to the practice squad? The rule used to be three weeks. They have to be on your. Oh, yeah. Sorry. They have. Yeah. Nick is what Nick said. They have to be on the active roster for three weeks before you can do anything with them. But I, I don't know. I mean, again, there's a lot of rules that have changed, so I'm not 
hundred percent sure about that. I would imagine that is still the, the case. Right. You can't just be moving guys. I can't you know. imagine they would change that because no. then you can just willy nilly poach people however you want no. without any repercussions. If, so if they changed it, it I have to be, imagine that's the same. If they changed that rule, it would be more weeks that you have to stay. I yeah. mean, because I mean, now you're moving me over here, and I've got a test over here. I, nah, I bet you that's still the same, if not more. But um, you know, the, the the Cam Irving to IR to return. Um, you know that's a new rule. You can put as many guys as you want, and they can, and you can bring them back as right. many guys as you want to. Um, and you know we thought that was the the case for Lyell. He still might be. We thought that was the case for Sean Lee. Well, speaking of which, there was a report. Thank you, Nick, for the setup. There was a report from Jane Slater that came out uh, about 20 minutes ago, uh, where she said that a linebacker Sean Lee is expected to be out six weeks after undergoing hernia surgery last week uh, in Philadelphia. That means he wouldn't be back until mid-October. Um, guys concerned? <laughs> not, not with what you would think. Is it six weeks from, from now, from today, or six weeks from when he was initially placed on IR? It would probably be from the time he had the surgery, which is, which is according to this report, it happened last week. Not sure on the timing of this. And again, these are this is her report. Not sure. The team has not made an official statement, so not sure if that's yeah. officially what happened or, or actually what happened. But just according to this report, six weeks, uh, which would get him back about mid-October. It, I, it doesn't matter what, like when what the timeline is. If he's not ready to go two weeks from now, that's concerning, which... That was always going to be a possibility. And if you think about the timelines, Mike McCarthy said today probably four to six weeks for Cam Irving. And so now we're here in, you know, maybe six weeks for Sean Lee. So it makes sense uh, that they would go get Smith and Light. You know, they're not going to be able to help on Sunday, but they can help you account for that, uh, you know, over the next month or so. But hell yeah, it's concerning. <laughs> yeah, I mean, all of a sudden, these three positions, uh, you throw in the tight end with it. These three positions, uh, I think, are are really, really problems for this team because I don't think they have, number one, a person that can step into those roles that have now been been lost. And, and even their depth, I don't think they have much depth at those positions. And so I, I think all three of them I'm concerned about. Yeah. I, I just, I mean, I'm more concerned. I mean, yeah, I'm concerned about that with, with Sean Lee. I'm just kind of frustrated by that. I mean, did that help the Rams? I mean, did that help you? I mean, like, well, just just say it. I mean, this is this is a prominent player who's been in the Pro Bowl twice. He's he's one of the the team leaders. He's having surgery in Philadelphia. I mean, Terrence Newman had the same surgery surgery in 2008, and it was reported right then. I mean, who cares? I mean, I I, I, I just don't understand that kind of stuff. I maybe during the week, if you don't want to say that a player is playing so much and it's a different running back or a different quarterback, I get it. But you've got. You know, you've got a, a really good player and a good person that, that is working. You know, he's worked so hard to get through injuries. He's got another injury. Why not just say it? I, I, I'm not. I'm missing that part. I don't get it. He's, he's going to Philadelphia for surgery. That's not the end of the world to report that. I just don't know why they wouldn't do that. Yeah, it's, Am I missing something here? I mean, what? I mean, obviously there are there are things. <laughs> Did that help Sean McVay? Like, oh man, we thought Sean Lee was going to be out there, but well, now no, he's but, in Philly. But I do think that they would probably make the argument, right or wrong. I think they would probably make the argument that you know we don't necessarily need every team knowing that because the longer we hold that information, there may be another team that's thinking of, they they're trying to look for. I mean, I'm sorry, linebackers on another practice squad that may, if they know that we're looking for them, it kind of maybe accelerates that, right? It, mm. It's those kind of things. Where again. What we all know from covering this team and covering the NFL is coaches live in a whole different world. Yeah. Like their mindset is it's just a whole different world. And the things they worry about are well, things that a lot of points that, that, that would we, be you. That would be you worrying about something like you got much bigger things to worry about. If you're thinking that far ahead, I mean, there, there's a problem there because your focus should be somewhere else. Well, I think it's it's all a part of it, and uh, again, it may not be the same person. Maybe this is people who are more responsible for personnel who would prefer that not to be out there than maybe the head coach. All I'm saying is we know from covering this team and yeah. covering the NFL, they aren't the only people that think like that. There are a lot of teams around the NFL that try very hard to keep everything behind closed doors because the point is they don't want to give anything away and possibly risk yeah. that they lose something that they want to be able to or some advantage that they would have uh, in whatever decision that they want to make. 
I mean, it's just part of the. It's part of how football coaches do it. You know. Yeah, they, the same coaches that, that still cover their mouth when they right. when they try to, to call play with a mask on, like, <laughs> right. and they're covering her. Like, it's no. just that's how football coaches are and football personnel people are. I well, think. that's part of it. Maybe it's yeah, not about the part football of coach though. Never. Yeah, maybe it's not. But um, I not do think reflecting. Uh, Go ahead, Dave. I was just going to be. It's not reflecting in the standings through one week, so we'll see how it goes going forward. Yeah, those those numberless numberless uh, pra- that numberless practice there that didn't really <laughs> help out too much. But anyway, nah. All right, uh, here's what I want to do. Um, let's go ahead and take our final break. We're going to take it a little early. When we come back, I want to dive into the Cowboys' defense. I had some interesting numbers coming out of that first week of games, um, and I want to throw them at you guys and get some opinions on what you think that maybe these things mean in the grand scheme of things for the Cowboys' defense. We'll come right back. This is DallasCowboys.com. Radio. Since 1865, Stetson hats are American made with pride right here in Texas. And Stetson is proud to be on the field with America's team. Want to show your Texas and team pride too? You can. By purchasing your own Stetson, you can look just like how the flag guys do on field at every home game. Stetson hats, the official crown of all self respecting Cowboys and your favorite football team. Get yours today at shop.dallascowboys.com or at stetson.com. I'm Jay Novacek, former tight end for the Dallas Cowboys. Back in the day, I was the guy who always got the tough yards, and that's why I run with John Deere today. In fact, I have a John Deere 3025E tractor that can handle any yard work I need to do, even the tough yards way out back. So if you have one acre or a thousand, John Deere has the equipment that's just right for you. Visit a John Deere dealer today and run with us. We are the official tractor provider of your Dallas Cowboys. Want to use what the pros use? How about the official men's skincare brand of the Dallas Cowboys, Jack Black? Right now, you can get the Jack Black Starter, a curated collection of Cowboys locker room favorites for just 10 bucks with free shipping. The starter includes four Jack Black skincare favorites plus a full-sized intense therapy lip balm. Go to getjackblack.com slash cowboys and use the code word TEAMJB. That's getjackblack.com slash cowboys. The Jack Black Starter, 10 bucks, free shipping. We're back with a tasty treat that's sweeping airwaves and taste buds. It's new Dr. Pepper and Cream Soda. Let's take a listen. Dr. Pepper and Cream Soda's here. A new combo that's music to my ears, okay. Let's play. Cream Soda and Dr. Pepper time. Pour it in a glass of ice. Ah, music to my ears and mouth. New Dr. Pepper and Cream Soda. A delicious duet. Back to the break. Welcome back. It is the final segment of the break live from the SWBC Mortgage Studios at the Star. We got Dave and Amber also here at the Star. We're uh, talking Cowboys versus Falcons. This segment, what I want to do is I have some uh, some interesting little tidbits about this defense uh, that I noticed from the game last week, and I want to throw those out at you, and then we're going to talk about some of the things that they, uh, what those things mean. In your minds, uh, last week the Cowboys were 12th in scoring defense, only allowing 20 points. Bucky mentioned that in uh, in the segment we did with him about the fact that even though they gave up a lot of yards, didn't give up a lot of points. Uh, they were 28 though in the number of yards allowed at 422. Did we misevaluate how they played because it looked so bad at the start, um, knowing the fact that they did bend quite a bit as far as the number of yards they gave up, but did still hold this team to 20 points? Let's start first with you, Nick. Well, I just they didn't make enough plays. I mean, that that's the same goes with with the offense. I mean, they, yeah, they they had their moments. They they got in a turnover, uh, but but when they needed to make a stop with them pushed back like that, that's what they, McCarthy was counting on. He was counting on that. He was at like you know if we don't make it here, we at least we got them pushed back until they weren't pushed back anymore. So. Um, you know, and it's not just Dak and the offense that didn't have, didn't come up with clutch moments. It was the, it was the defense as well. So in a game like that, I mean, they needed to be better. It's not necessarily their fault. They thought maybe they thought the offense would score more points, but they didn't. Uh, when they were really counted on to go make a play, um, they didn't, they didn't make it. At least not with enough time. Um, the Rams got too far and, and flipped the field before they got the ball back. Amber. Uh, Dave, you go ahead first before I open my mouth and start <laughs> highly criticizing. Yes. AG's Here we like, go. No, Derek. <laughs> I'm freaking buying it, Derek. Um, I mean, you know, 
give some credit where it's due. The Rams scored seven points in the second half. Like the defense did become a little bit more reliable as the game went along. But this isn't one of those circumstances where you can say, oh, if you cut out the one long run, they did this. Like they allowed the Rams to run 25 plays, I think, in the first like eight minutes of the game. Like the Rams just absolutely marched the field twice in a row completely uh, I mean, and and that that alters the flow of the entire game because it's going to wear your defense out. It's going to swing time of possession. It's obviously going to give the Rams two opportunities at scoring right off the bat. Like you can't do that. You can't. You cannot just be that inept for that long to start a game. So yeah, they definitely got their act together. Um, but that doesn't that doesn't do enough to excuse how unprepared they were for the start of the game. Am I the only one who thinks that the Rams didn't play that well either? Like, that's how I see it right now. I see it that, yes, obviously the Rams got the win and they made it happen. But at the end of the day, looking at the, ha- the game as a whole, I didn't think the offense did that great of a job. So in my mind, I don't think that the Cowboys defense were trying to stop this amazing offense that's just – eating up yards and scoring points. I think that uh, it's just they, they could have done a lot better. They didn't. Obviously, the score doesn't necessarily fully reflect all their faults there that they made. But at the same time, I just don't think they were playing against this great, amazing team. You know, I'll say this, though, Amber. I, I kind of disagree with you a bit on that. I do think the Rams played well for the game plan that they had. I think their game plan coming in was we want to control the clock, which means that we're going to play this this short, quick game, and and that means that there are going to be some drives that we're going to stall out. There are going to be some drives that we'll drive the field and we'll get a touchdown. There will be some we'll drive the field we'll get a field goal. The point is if we keep their offense off the field and we keep their defense on the field, as the game wears on, we think we can come away with more points than they can because they are a volume offense. And so I think they actually played perfectly within the context of what they have to do. Now, will that work against every team? The team has got a good defense? Probably not. But a team like this, where the Cowboys are a little limited on defense, I think it was a perfect, and especially having such a great offense, I think it was a really great game plan. I think they played it well. What do you guys think? It, it worked for them. I just, I just, I feel like I saw mistakes that they made that had had their game been a lot more clean, they would have been a lot better. And I guess that can apply to right. everyone in the NFL. But I just feel that the Rams didn't give the best that they could. But regardless, it worked on their benefit, and they made it work and won the game. But the way I saw it, I feel like. They, they had the ability to play a lot better than they did. I got you. Uh, I think, I mean, if the Rams had played up to their potential, they should have had that game in hand with five minutes to play. You think about, obviously, they missed an easy field goal. And then Sean McVay made two or three really questionable decisions that I thought killed a couple of drives. I mean, credit to the Cowboys for stopping it, but I don't know why in the hell you run a toss dive on third and short. And I don't know why you don't go for it with the way that you were playing when you have fourth and short. And I, I think the ball was pretty close to midfield. So I, I agree with you. The Rams, they could have played better, but they played well enough to win. Yeah, I think in week one you probably saw that around the league that there are a lot of teams that probably could have played a little bit better without having preseason games. But, again, I think they played, played within the context of what their game plan was, and I think they executed it pretty well. Here's a question from a standpoint of long term. Do you think that in most weeks, if the Cowboys defense can hold to 20, the Cowboys will be a successful team overall? Nick, let's start with you. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think so. I mean, I, I'd like to think the offense is going to get in gearing and get and get better. Uh, you, you'd like to say that, you know, the injuries will, will help in getting, you know, if you can get some of those guys back um, on the offensive line, getting Lyle Collins back. Obviously, you got to figure out what you're going to do at tight end. But, uh, yeah, I think I think 20 is a pretty good number there. If you, you know, for this team, they can, they can get, I think the offense has shown that they will be able to get more than that. But, uh, you know, the Rams, to, to what they were saying about the Rams, you know, they, they, they live off their defense. I mean, they have the best defensive player in the NFL. And so, you know, I think you know, going for it on fourth down or not going for it, it, it's like, well, we rely on our defense. And I think McCarthy's still trying to figure out his team. I think he was relying on that defense to stop him down there, and it didn't happen. So he's going to – we hear it all the time. Brian Brado says it once a week. you got to 
coaches have to know their team. They have to trust their team. He's still trying to figure out what he's got on his team. Amber, 20 points enough? I, I think so, absolutely. I think that, that just it's going to depend on the offense and them doing their part, scoring points. I think that 17 points for this offense, obviously it's not enough, but looking at the talent that they have, I still believe that they should be able to score a lot more than they did in this game. So at the end of the day, right now, I think that they'll be able to create the right balance there to to get wins. But yeah, 20 points, if the defense can hold them to that, I think it'll, it'll be fine. Dave? If 20 points isn't enough, then what are we even doing here? <laughs> like why, like just, if 20 points isn't enough on a regular basis, just let me know now and I'll take an early vacation. Uh, I'm so serious because the quarterback wants 40 mil, the running back's making 90 mil, the offensive line has been to a billion Pro Bowls. Uh, one of the receivers is up for is on a hundred mil, and then a first round pick. Like, how is twenty points not enough? This team should be scoring at least three touchdowns on a reliable basis. They should be flirting with thirty more often than not. And you know, the sky's not falling because that didn't happen week one. And honestly, I'm encouraged that I mean, they didn't they didn't translate it into points because they couldn't convert third downs, but. All of the hallmarks of a good offense were still there. I mean, Zeke looked great. Dak looked great. Um, the receiver, the, the big three combined for 200 receiving yards, uh, and that was with shoddy protection. So I'm still optimistic that they'll get there, but if this team can't reliably score 21 or more points, then just let me know now so I can do something else. And I agree with that. I think at the end of the day, the question will be, was the 20 points that the defense gave up, was that because at one point it, it, the, there wasn't really a lot for the, like the Rams didn't feel like they had to start airing it out like we saw with, their, uh, with Atlanta here in, in their fourth quarter. Uh, and if they were in that kind of situation, would they give up a ton more points to a better yeah. offense, right? That's the part that, that does concern me a bit, but I think 20 points should be enough on most weeks if this offense is what we yeah. think it's it, what it is. It should be. The, the thing is, is it, who, who on the Rams offense is going to make the Pro Bowl? I don't think anybody makes the Pro Bowl on that team. Uh, they have some guys that have made the Pro Bowl. Probably Woods. Yeah, Woods is Robert the Pro Woods, Bowl. Andrew Cup Whitworth. Could. I mean, like, it's just a matter of – They could. Yeah. They could, but – they probably won't. I mean, you got to be one of the top four receivers. I, I don't think they I, will. I, we've seen it happen. It'll, we've seen it happen in the last couple is, of years. My point is, it'll get a lot tougher for that defense, and it gets tougher in about four days. Now they don't. It won't be as hard on on defense. I mean, for their offense because they don't have Aaron Donald on every week. But I'm just saying, it gets tougher than Jared Goff to Robert Woods with Cam Akers running the ball. These next two weeks, that. it's going to be tougher. Hey. Yeah. I, I, I disagree slightly. I mean, I do agree. Like, defending Atlanta and Seattle is probably going to be tougher than what they went up against. But that offense was a machine in 2018 and dealt with a lot of injuries last year. And I, I'll say it for the 10th time, I don't think the world of Jared Goff, but that combination of the continuity that they have plus Sean McVay, that offense is a well-oiled machine. Like, there ain't any shame in giving up, you know, 400 yards to those guys. I mean, that was the offense. They went down to Mexico City against Kansas City and combined for like 150 points. Like those guys aren't slouches at all. Yep. So it will it is it will get tougher, but that's still a really good offense. All right, let's move on to the next topic. Uh, Cowboys were 24th in passing yards allowed with 269. They were 27th in rushing yards allowed with 153. Which do you think is a bigger problem? for the Cowboys' defense as you see it right now, their run defense or their pass defense? Let's start first with you, Dave. Uh, pass because, I mean, Jalen Smith deserves plenty of criticism, but it, one strength of his game is defending the run. Um, Demarcus Lawrence is good against the run, Everson Griffin. And, and, you know, like I brought up with Bucky, they gave up a lot of rushing yards, but the average was fine. Um, I think a lot of that is a product of, of – trailing for a lot of that game so that doesn't concern me as much as a the pass rush didn't look great on Sunday night and b you know we knew going into this season that the secondary was going to be a problem or at least a weak spot and uh you know I didn't see anything on Sunday that changed my mind about that Amber that's a tough one for me I mean they're equally as important but I <laughs> And I know we have a, it's a new season and every new season, it, you just never know how the team is gonna fully change compared to last year. But 
I just can't forget those games from last year where they were killed by running backs who basically had no, like, very little experience in the NFL, and yet they were able to just get them and kill them and score points and, and lose games because of that. So to me, I think that's an area uh, that I'm still kind of focusing on and keeping my eye on, and I'm leaning more towards the uh, rush defense, but... Uh, uh, so they're both. They're both a problem. Sorry. I mean, yeah, she's right about that. Yeah, they're both. They're both problems. I would say I, I trust Mike Nolan to do a better job of of getting them in position to stop the run. If, if your secondary is just not good and the guys just can't cover, then there's not much you can really do. I mean, you can try to get a pass. You rush, can blitz right? yeah. and all that stuff, but I mean, if they still can't cover that well, you know, they're only going to get you know. 80, 90-yard touchdowns thrown on them. Uh, so I, I think that I, I trust the, the run defense a little better than I trust the pass defense at this point. All right, Atlanta was second in offense last week with 522 yards, as I mentioned earlier in the show. They were first in passing offense with 434 yards. They had three wide receivers. Catch this. Three wide receivers had nine catches and 100-plus yards in their week one game against the Seattle Seahawks, who have a pretty good defense. Yeah. Um, that all being said, do you think the Cowboys have enough good defenders to match up against Julio, <clears throat> Ridley, Gage, and even Hurst, who had a nice downfield catch last uh, last week at the tight end position? You think they have enough defenders to defend those guys? Let's start with you, Dave. I mean, I'm sorry, uh, Nick. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, I'm a, no offense to the game, but I think that I think the stats and where the rankings are just way way early, just because you know you. you it's just one game, and, and it was. They don't want that. Like they don't want three catch, three guys with nine. They don't want to be second in, in passing yards because that means they got their ass kicked. And so we saw that last year with all the Dax numbers. It's because they were a lot of it was hollow. So um, to answer the question, yeah, I, th- I mean, I think they do, but it's on the offensive side of the ball. Is the, is the offense going to score points to put them in position? To be like that, I, I think I think it all comes back to the offense. It's all about playing for your strength, and so I think if the offense does their job, yes, the defense I think can be uh, good enough to, to stop that Atlanta offense. Amber, can you repeat your question again? I'm, I'm, it was a little confusing to me. Do the Cowboys have enough defenders to stop the offensive weapons for the Falcons? And looking at the stats, what you name, I'm like, <laughs> I was thinking, I'm like, wait. Shouldn't that have been the Cowboys? Shouldn't we have had those numbers here the first week? But, oh well, 3,000-yard three, 3, receivers. We're on a great path right now. But um, anyways, I, I think that the, it's just going back to your defensive line, Derek, that you keep talking about, mm-hmm. where it needs to start, where they need to create pressure. I'm hoping, because I, that's where I feel that the Cowboys currently have the most talent on defense. So I think that it, it absolutely needs to start there. Hopefully, Demarcus Lawrence elevates his game this week with the help of, uh, of Alden Smith, who thankfully at least had a nice game last week. But I'm just hoping to rely more this week on the pass rush and get those guys putting some pressure there in order to help those uh, secondary players in the back end just trying to stop a guy like Julio Jones. It's going to be tough. It's going to be tough. So they're going to definitely need to get help from every single guy on defense. Dave. Uh, I mean, if we're going to criticize Dak to no end for putting up garbage time stats, we got to, I mean, you got to look at the context of this because Atlanta didn't start going off until they were down 31 to 12 in that game. I think that's worth noting. But they still have all that talent. And yet, no, I don't think, I don't think the Dallas defense is equipped to hold them down. Uh, and that, that goes back to the point of, you know, Ideally, if you tell me I can hold them to 24, 28 against that offense, I would like to think the Cowboys offense can be better. Uh, you know, Atlanta's defense will, you know, will get to them tomorrow, but they look terrible against Russell Wilson. So I'm, I'm counting on the Dallas offense to be able to score 31, 35 points in this game. Maybe that's ambitious after watching them score 17, but I don't think you're winning this game unless you score in the high 20s. 
Yeah, I will say this. I don't or think the thirties cor- preferably. Yeah, I don't. I don't think the Sorry. Cowboys cornerbacks really were challenged very much last week, and I certainly don't think they were the biggest part of the problem for the Dallas defense. I think I had a much bigger problem with their defensive tackles, much bigger problem with the linebackers, and to some degree, a much bigger problem with their safeties, particularly in run support, uh, than I did with the cornerbacks last week. But again. I don't think they were challenged nearly as much. And again, I understand the the, the numbers can can skew that way, and it because it's just one week sample size. But I don't think any of us are disputing the fact that those, particularly those two top wide receivers, are great talents, and they're going to be a handful yeah. for the secondary to be able to manage. All right, we appreciate you guys joining us. We are back tomorrow, normal time at 11:30 a.m. Central Time. Till then, for Nick Eatman, Dave Helmer, Hellman, Amber Garcia, I am Derek Eagleton. This has been the break live on DallasCowboys.com. Radio. This has been a production of DallasCowboys.com and the Dallas Cowboys Football Club. How about this, Cowboys?